If you have ever longed for love and used the law of attraction, visualization, manifestation, or any type of method that promised and basically guaranteed that you would find the love of your life only to end up in a toxic relationship with a partner who wasn't good to you, I want you to know two things. First of all, you're not alone. This has happened to millions of people. And we're going to talk about why it happens. And it's probably not for the reasons that you think. And second, it's not your fault. You did not do this to yourself. Okay, so I want to make that very, very clear. I don't believe that you have some type of unresolved trauma, some type of subconscious belief that warrants the abuse that you experienced in a relationship when you were looking for love. So let's start with that. So any type of self, self-loathing or self-blame that you're holding on to, I hope that by the end of this video, you will be able to release that, if not all of it, at least some of it, because relationships come with interesting dynamics and even when we know that we're not wrong, we can still feel a sense of shame for what was done to us. And so while I cannot offer any type of emotional relief for what you're going through, although I wish I could, I can hopefully give you an explanation that makes sense. So let's start from the beginning, okay? Let's talk about this idea of using the law of attraction and different manifestation techniques to attract love. Now, if you've watched any videos here on YouTube or if you've dove into any books about how to attract love, how to find your soulmate, how to blah, 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 then I'm sure you are familiar with these different manifestation techniques. So we have a vision board, which is really popular, where you take different images that represent the type of loving relationship that you want to be in. So you take these images, you put them on your vision board, and you place them up where you're going to see that vision board based on love every single day. The second thing that you might do is affirmations. You might tell yourself, I am worthy of love. I'm ready for love. I am open for love to come into my life, right? And you really focus on love and you think about what it's going to feel like to be in that loving relationship. Another technique that's extremely popular is visualization. This is when you close your eyes, you'll probably get into somewhat of a meditative state and you visualize what that loving relationship will look like. Maybe you visualize holding hands and looking deeply into each other's eyes, going out for dinner. Maybe you like to cook and so you envision yourself in this beautiful home, beautiful kitchen, you're cooking food for you and your loved one but you really kind of visualize this image, this, this life for yourself on how you and the person of your dreams are going to behave towards each other. So you have mapped it out, you know what you're looking for in someone, and now the universe is going to do its thing and you're going to do your thing. That all sounds great on the surface, right? So if we're focusing on love, and if we're doing all the right things, you know, we're saying the right prayers, we're visualizing the right things, we write down the characteristics, we maybe have a dream journal of our dream soulmate, we're, do it, we're doing all the right things, and we know we're doing the right things, then why is it that we end up attracting someone who seems to meet all the criteria in the beginning, but later reveals a different part of themselves? Why is this happening? Why is someone coming into our lives pretending to be what we are putting out into the universe and then later over time, they're not behaving in those ways anymore? Is it because you're not holding the intention? Is it because somehow some type of secret belief that you're not worthy of love started to come up? No, I don't think that's the case at all. Babe, let me tell you this. I believe with 100% certainty and conviction that you are deserving of love and you're deserving of love even if you do have some unresolved beliefs and self-esteem issues. Because guess what? We all have them, me included, I'm included in that. So even if you do have some false beliefs or you have some self-esteem issues, which again, most of us have, um, I have yet to meet someone who doesn't have some type of issue that they're working on, you deserve love. You don't deserve anything less than that and you didn't attract something less than that because you still have these beliefs inside of you. 
So why do we attract this? What, what is going on here? All right, so over the past few months, I have been obsessed with reading about neuroscience and neuroplasticity. Um, and when I say I'm obsessed, I really mean that I am listening to all the podcasts, reading all the books I can get my hands on. I am just absolutely fascinated by neuroplasticity and truth is have been for a long time. And I'm also very interested in how it plays a role in things like the law of attraction and what comes into our lives. And so when it comes to this phenomenon of millions of people longing for love, visualizing it, working on themselves, building healthy beliefs, and ending up in relationships that destroy them and shatter their heart. You better believe I'm going to pay attention to that and ask the question, why? Why is this happening? And for those of you who don't know my story, uh, something similar happened to me where years ago I was manifesting love. I was holding the visualizations. I was journaling. I met someone who appeared to be everything that I was asking for. We had so many synchronicities every single day up until towards the end of our relationship. And so it was hard for me to believe that this person wasn't my divine partner, wasn't sent to me from the universe. I used to think that he was my treasure, my soulmate, the other part of me, um, not in a twin flames kind of way because I don't believe in twin flames, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> and sadly, over time, this, turn, this person turned out to be a liar, a manipulator. He uh, plagiarized my words and would often present my ideas on national TV, on different TV shows as if they were his own. And so he was actually gaining popularity for ideas and concepts I came up with while also flirting with other women cheating on me behind my back still lies about it to this day as far as I know so anyways this was a relationship that absolutely shattered me and it is taking me years to get over it and if I'm honest um, there's still a lot of things that were done to my done to my psyche in that relationship that I'm still recovering from and unfortunately it's probably going to take years to recover from the damage that this individual did to me all the while he's still smiling and gaining fame and, um, you know, he's engaged to some other girl. And so it is hurtful. You know, it, it is frustrating because here's a man who destroyed my life and he knows full well that he did. And after I broke up with him, he sent me these <clears throat> letters acknowledging that he was a poor boyfriend, that he should have done more. And yet while he was sending me <laughs> these letters, he was confessing his love to someone else and already dating um, at least three other women that I know of. So real great guy, right? So what happened that I attracted that? What what led to all of this? Okay, so let's start with the basics. Let's look at neuroplasticity and understand how this can happen even with the best of intentions. Neuroplasticity is the art of repeating something over and over again in your mind so that you can create new neural pathways, right? That's when you read about neuroplasticity, obviously there's more to it than that. <laughs> but when you're looking at neuroplasticity and how to really kind of develop a new identity and new belief systems, repetition plays a huge role. Of course, there's other things that can happen too that can cause new neural pathways to open up, um, like even just learning a new skill like language or, or playing the guitar or playing an instrument is a form of neuroplasticity. But when we're using neuroplasticity to create a new reality for ourselves and maybe even create a new identity for ourselves, it boils down to repetition and a lot of times visualization because we are trying to embed in our mind what we want to dive into, what we want to attract. So the reason that this is important is because the brain doesn't like what is unfamiliar. Remember, the job of your brain, of your mind, is to keep you safe. So let's say that this phenomenal opportunity opens up for you, and you start to feel like this feeling of ick, like, Ugh, I don't know if I should take this opportunity. It seems too good to be true. Is that intuition? Is that fear? Or is that just your brain protecting you because your brain cannot understand the concept of this huge opportunity that has been handed to you? So it's, it's, it's a quite, it's an interesting question, right? Like, which one is it? Well, it's probably all of them because if this huge opportunity lands in your lap, 
and you're feeling weird about it and you feel like you can't handle it, like you're not cut out for this thing that just came to you, then you're probably going to self-sabotage it or you may not have enough knowledge and skills to be able to walk into that opportunity and handle the dynamics and the responsibilities and obligations surrounding it correctly. So your brain knows that you're not ready for it. So if you take a hold of it, it's going to feel weird and maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. But either way, there's going to be that feeling of, I don't know, putting on the brakes, right? And so that's where neuroplasticity is really helpful because when we rehearse a situation in our mind over and over again, and when we are realistic about the responsibilities and obligations and requirements that are needed to maintain this thing that we're wanting to attract or that we're wanting to have or be, our mind adjusts to the idea and organically begins to shift into a person who can handle those responsibilities with ease and with grace, right? I'm sure you have done this in numerous different ways in your own life and you just didn't realize that's what it was. So if you've ever learned a new language, maybe you wanted to learn how to speak French or Spanish and you just started repeating the words over and over again, when you look at where you were when you started your journey and learning this new language versus where you are now years down the line, you'll notice that you feel quite comfortable speaking fluently to someone in that language, whereas years ago you wouldn't have, right? That's neuroplasticity at work. That is, that is learning a new language. That is becoming comfortable and practicing and doing something over and over again, repetitiveness at work, turns you from a beginner who's maybe a little apprehensive to an absolute genius, or at least someone who's really good at the skill now. So when it comes to using this technique with love, what we tend to do is exactly what we're told to do. We visualize what we want in someone. So we're going to visualize all the good things because we're told a lot of times, especially in the law of attraction, that if we hold a negative belief, that that's what we're going to attract, right? But if we hold positive beliefs, that's what we're going to bring in more. And supposedly, if we have more positive beliefs and thoughts, the negative ones, then the negative beliefs will stay at bay and only positive things will happen to us. Obviously, that has not been our experience. <laughs> Those of us who went through 2020 and, you know, survived 2020, we know that positive thinking um, cannot protect us from whatever curveballs life wants to throw our way, right? Maybe certain forms of positive thinking can help us get through difficult times, or maybe not. Uh, but we know it doesn't protect us exactly. So we kind of went through a worldwide experiment on that front and we failed. <laughs> so we, we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that positive thinking doesn't keep negative things from happening, right? Especially, unfortunately, when it comes to love and sharing our lives with someone else. So when we are visualizing our dream person, we might be getting very detailed, right? We might be thinking about their hair color or their height and all the physical attributes. But if we're really smart, which hopefully all of us are, in fact, I know we are. Why did I say hopefully? Of course we are. We're also thinking about the characteristics, right? We want them to be altruistic. We want them to have integrity. We want them to be honest, compassionate, kind. We want all of those attributes that make us feel safe, but also make that person a safe um, haven for us and for other people as well, right? So we really start visualizing what that looks like and what that feels like. And so this is where things get, I think, a little interesting and possibly a little hairy. So we're really visualizing the dates, the fun, the ways that we're going to spend time together, the compliments. Maybe we're visualizing the sound of this person's voice. Maybe we're visualizing getting texts from them and getting so excited. And it's just like this really feel good, euphoric feeling. So essentially what we've done is we've created a template, right? We've created a template of the type of person that we wanted. And we have attached this emotional charge to it. We have trained our brain 
We've trained our mind. We've even trained our body and our sympathetic nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system. Anyways, we've trained ourselves to look for this specific person who's going to have these specific qualities. And so what happens is this template is created and it's reinforced in our minds. So when we meet someone who on the onset has these characteristics, they're demonstrating kindness, they're demonstrating compassion, maybe they're funny, maybe they're charming, maybe they're good looking, maybe they open the door for an old lady and we're just like, oh, <laughs> you know, they've got a level of politeness. What happens is if that person's also showing interest in us, that program starts to kick on because that person is demonstrating the things that we embedded into that template. Now, keep in mind, we don't know that person yet. We just know that they're showing us this part of themselves. And as we get to know them better and talk to them more, maybe they're very complimentary. Maybe they speak to us in our five love languages. Maybe they know how to present themselves as an empathic person. Maybe they even call themselves empathic or sensitive or whatever it is. But there's things about them that immediately trigger a response from us because we've embedded it in our own system so well that we have this natural response, right? Our program turns on. So of course we're like, oh my gosh, this is the person we're looking for. So time goes on and this person starts to reveal parts of themselves that maybe isn't so pleasant, right? And maybe we notice red flags, maybe we don't. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, red flags are hard for me to determine at times because everyone's human, everyone has their flaws. So sometimes I'm like, is this a red flag that you stay away from? Or is this a red flag that you're like, okay, this person made a mistake. And I'm someone who believes that people can change if they want to. I mean, I know I've changed over the last few years. I do believe that if somebody wants to change, they can. I believe that um, remorse and shame can guide us to be better versions of ourselves. So when someone approaches you about a past mistake that they've made and they're vulnerable, it can actually be a beautiful experience if they are showing remorse and mentioning how they changed and what they went through on a personal journey to make sure that that thing that they don't behave that way again, right? Like they're not going to do this thing again. And so when we hear these type of things, it can be difficult, especially if we've already caught feelings to figure out, okay, is this a red flag? Should I drop and run? <laughs> or did this person learn from this? The reality is that it takes time to get to know someone. And so when we already like someone and the red flags start to pop up, we're going to override them because we've already programmed our own system and our own brain to love the template that this person is portraying. We've programmed ourselves to love and to be excited when we see someone who is empathic, compassionate, honest, um, you know, just has all the good things. Maybe they're ambitious. Maybe they seem protective, whatever it is. And so when this red flag pops up, the feelings that we have of endearment and excitement for this person are going to override the red flag because when we were doing our visualizations, we didn't account for that. We didn't account for how we were going to behave or how we were going to feel when this person would come up with significant red flags. And maybe that's where this problem lies. Because I don't know a lot of people who have used the law of attraction or any manifestation technique to attract love and has stayed in that relationship long term. I'm sure they're out there. In fact, if you watch YouTube, you hear stories of people who have used the law of attraction to attract their soulmate. And they've been with that person for 10 years. And at this point in the game, I think a lot of us kind of suspect that maybe that's the exception and not the rule. And that's why that story is so special because it's not usual. Unfortunately, it just doesn't, it just doesn't, right? So what is the takeaway here? What is it that we need to do? So if we've created the template 
if we've done all the right things, we've created the vision board, we've journaled, we've decided what type of characteristics we want this person to have, and we found someone who matches that, and our systems turned on, the program turned on, the love and affection that we've been programming ourselves to have when we meet a person who displays these characteristics all turns on. So the program essentially worked. What happens when we start seeing evidence that this person may not be who we think they are? What happens when the red flags become blaring? Like we recognize this person's cheating on us. This person's lying to us. This person has been hiding something big from us, maybe hiding another family, or maybe it's something smaller than that where they just lie about something consistently every day, or they don't come back from work after their shift ends, but they won't tell you where they've been. Like these are not good things, right? Because in a relationship, you need to be with someone who you feel safe with. You need to be with someone who's going to be open with you and not so secretive. So there's a lot of things that need to be in place for a healthy relationship for both people, not just one, right? Because a relationship needs to serve both individuals. So what do we do in this situation? I believe that the reason that the law of attraction goes wrong when we're manifesting love is because we don't spend any time thinking about the red flags that we absolutely do not want in our lives and how we will visualize how we will stand up for ourselves and our own value when those pop up. I think it's actually really important to visualize how you will handle negative situations. So for example, we'll say that someone's a cheater, right? We meet this guy, he seems fantastic, we fall in love, he's saying all the right things. A year into the relationship, we realize that he's been talking to someone else he has been sending some other girl flowers or he's been flirting with her online. You can see their interactions on a social media platform and you're sitting here wondering what the actual, hmm. And you confront this person and he's going to lie about it, right? He's probably going to lie about it. Or he's going to be like, why are you making a big deal out of this? Like, I've known this person for forever. There's nothing going on. Like, you're insane. You're crazy. Blah, 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 blah. So what do you do in that situation? Well, if you've been with that person for a year and you've already caught feelings and they're good to you for the most part, like maybe you guys are having small arguments or whatever, but then this pop up, it can be really confusing. And yeah, a lot of people are going to say, well, just leave. Well, you already know that when you love someone, it's not always as simple as that. Plus, there are other dynamics involved, right? You might already have a financial obligation somehow. Maybe you guys moved in or who knows? I mean, there's just a lot of things that can happen. And so when this person is behaving in this way, you never created a program that taught you how to deal with this. Like, how do you deal with it when someone you love, and that person also says that they love you, right? They've chosen you. What do you do in this situation? It's confusing because we haven't programmed ourselves for it. We, at no point in time, while we were manifesting love and attracting something good for ourselves, at no point did we stop and ask the question, how do I wanna behave if this situation pops up? We didn't mentally rehearse it. And so I think that's where a lot of this goes wrong. So for example, one of the things that my last ex did was he frequently stole ideas from me. Now these ideas could be word for word, a joke that I told that I came up with and he would say it on Facebook or on his podcast as if it was his own idea, as if it was his own joke, and he would give no credence to me. He did that frequently. I would share an idea that I had, a theory I had about a spiritual concept, and he would put it in his book or in one of his public speaking gigs, or he may insert it on his podcast, and he would not give me credit for it. He would make it seem as if this was his idea. And the other thing that he did, because we both had YouTube channels, is I would tell him that I was going to make a video on a certain topic, and because he was too lazy or busy to come up with his own topic, he would use the topic I was going to use that same week 
release his video before mine and that way it made it look like I was copying him because I would record mine upload it and like have everything set up ahead of time he would make it look like he came up with those concepts and he came up with that idea first because he'd release his before mine was released and that's not something that you do to a partner that's not something you do to your girlfriend or boyfriend of course and it's not something that you even do to a professional peer so there was a deep betrayal that happened with that especially when I told him don't don't talk about that topic that week you already know that I'm doing that like I already recorded the video and I have it uploaded and scheduled and he would just shrug it off like my feelings didn't matter like he wasn't being professionally underhanded or even underhanded just in our own relationship. So these are the things that I dealt with. And it was really frustrating to me because there was a part of me that was like, I love this person, but why is he doing this? You know, I didn't, I didn't understand that this is how someone treats you when they don't love you and they don't respect you. But my program was on, right? I loved this person and I believed that he loved me even though over time, um, all the evidence was piling up showing that wasn't the case. He just, he enjoyed the benefits of being with me, but he didn't actually love me as a person. He didn't respect me as a person. And that was becoming very clear the more that, you know, the more that I was with him. So I do believe that when we are single and when we are wanting to manifest a healthy relationship we have also got to be clear about what we don't want in the relationship, right? We don't want betrayal. <laughs> we don't want to be lied to. We don't want to be plagiarized. We don't want to be cheated on. There's a lot of things that we don't want. And I do believe that it is important to actually visualize those outcomes as well so that we can visualize how we want to feel and how we want to respond and what consequence we want to lay down. Is the consequence simply going to be that we talk to the person about it, explain how we feel, maybe we talk about therapy or something like that, or is it going to be a situation where, hey, if this person shows me this side of them, I'm done. I'm shutting it down and I'm walking away. I do believe that if you visualize walking away from bad situations enough that it'll probably be easier to get over those relationships that you've had to close the door on. Because <laughs> for me, I don't know about you, but for me, and maybe this is an ADHD thing, I don't know, it is really difficult to let past relationships go. Like there's people who have left my life years ago that I still think about, that I still miss. My ex is not one of them, just to be clear. But there are people who were important to me that for one reason or another stopped talking to me. They ghosted me. And while I have an idea of why they may have done that, I don't know for sure. And then there are people who I walked away from who I still sometimes look back at and I'm like, gosh, did I make the right move? I mean, I know that I did. But I still feel some sense of remorse because relationships are important to me. So I think it's a valuable skill to embed within yourself to know when to walk away. Because a lot of times in relationships, you're going to start to really see the red flags that are unforgivable, that you shouldn't stick around for within the first year, definitely by year two. And if you can gain not just the courage, but if you can program yourself to walk away from those things sooner rather than later, and feel good about it and keep your confidence and self-worth in the process without wondering if you should have stayed and you should have tried to work things out or whatever. I do believe that you're going to feel better about that situation and you're going to keep your soul intact <laughs> as you continue to move on and go look for the person who actually is the correct soulmate, who has all of those characteristics that you've wanted, that you've longed for, that you visualized and doesn't come with the red flags that would cause you to walk away. So think about the things that you don't want in someone. I really do think that this is important. Think about the things that you don't want in someone and understand this. When you are a high value person, 
when you are confident in yourself, when you have a high self-esteem, when you feel good about who you are, you're not going to attract just good people. There's going to be questionable people with questionable and just full-on malicious intent that come into your life and they will want to possibly be in a relationship with you because of something that you can offer, because of some way that they can benefit from who you are or what you have. And I have been in that situation numerous times. And you probably have too. So think about what you do not want to tolerate. What are your red flags? whether they're small or big. And remember, nothing. no red flag is small if it's important to you, right? If you're like, I don't want to be with someone who lies, and yet you end up dating someone, and later on you find that they lied about something, you know, maybe as a smaller medium lie, and you're like, well, I like this person. That was just a small lie. You might notice that the lies get bigger. <laughs> That's typically what happens, right? We're not talking white lies where you know, this person might tell someone that they look good when really they, they don't look that great. You know, that, that type of the niceties, the social niceties. We're not talking about that. If you program yourself to stand up for yourself and to walk away when this starts to happen, you might be agitated for a few days, but I think that you will more than likely be proud of yourself for not wasting your time with someone who lies because that runs against your program. Even if this person shows all of these other wonderful characteristics, opens the door for you maybe, pays for the bill, is great with his family, good to his kids, nice to animals, has, seems steady in other ways, but lies like a rug, <laughs> probably not a good match, probably not someone you want to stick around with. So take time to visualize a story where you're the main character and you are walking away from these jokers who are not treating you with the respect and with the consistent positive characteristics that you deserve. You deserve someone who stands in integrity. You deserve someone who loves you, who respects you, who is altruistic, who is kind, who is protective, who is compassionate, who's not going to throw you under the bus to get what they want, who's not going to throw you under the bus when their friends are bad-mouthing you. You deserve someone who's going to stand up for you. And if someone speaks poorly of you, you want a partner who's going to say, hey, don't talk about don't talk about my partner like that. Don't talk about my love like that. Like, that's not okay. That's what you deserve. That's what we all deserve. So knowing what you won't tolerate and what you don't want in your life is just as important as knowing what you do want in your life. And you do have to visualize both. You do have to visualize the consequence. You do have to visualize having a certain feeling in your body because you need to program yourself for that too. You need to program the reaction and the response for when these things come up because they will come up. They will come up. And just because you visualize these things doesn't mean you're going to attract them. Remember, we live in a world with a lot of different people who are not clear about their intentions. We live in a world where people will lie about what they want and who they are so that they can steal those things from you. It's terrible. And so we do need to protect ourselves because love is risky. And I wish I had known that earlier in life, I might've saved myself a lot of pain. So when you're single, you can be vulnerable and volatile and you need someone who's going to respect you. You need someone who's going to treat you the way that you know you deserve to be treated. So think about what you don't want and write it on paper and write down the consequences. Write down how you want to feel like. Do you want to feel angry? Do you want to feel empowered? Like, what do you want to feel when someone treats you in opposition to how you know you want to be treated? How do you want to maybe treat that person or stand up to them? If they show you a side of them that's unacceptable, how are you going to behave? And maybe do write about the things that are difficult in relationships and how you want to resolve that too. For example, sometimes two people from different political spheres can come together and they can have a great relationship, but they don't agree on the politics. 
not in not in the slightest. They don't agree on the politics. How are you going to handle those situations? For the most part, there's going to be things there that are, that are okay. For maybe there's others that are non-negotiables. But that's a situation where two people can have vastly different beliefs, but they can still come together and love each other and be gracious and wonderful towards each other. But when the political conversations pop up, maybe those get heated. So maybe even think about how you might handle something like that. Because the more prepared you are for the type of people that can potentially come into your life, the better decisions you're going to make and the more prepared you'll be to walk away if someone who seemingly looks good at first starts to behave in ways that run counter to who you are as a person and run counter to what you want and what you know you deserve. We need to be able to train our mind and our body to respond appropriately to the various different scenarios that can come up in dating and in relationships. And I really think that is the best way for us to stay safe and to find the person who's going to be a good match for us. And you deserve to find someone who's gonna be a good match for you. You do, you do. If you're not sure if you deserve that, then listen to me, you deserve someone who's gonna be the good match. So what is the takeaway here? The takeaway is you should absolutely be focusing on the things that you want in a healthy, loving relationship. You know, even if that comes down to the hair color and the type of uh, body that you're attracted to, what I'm not gonna judge. I'm not gonna judge what you want. Like that's your business, you know? Think about the characteristics, think about the hobbies, think about the things that the two of you want to do together, like really get into that. That is fantastic. And also think about the deal breakers. What are the deal breakers? What do you want to not tolerate? How are you going to respond? And it's easy to sit there and say, well, I wouldn't tolerate someone who cheated on me. Well, I wouldn't tolerate someone who stole my ideas. Well, I would walk away from, trust me, I've, I've heard it all. But the reality is, Numerous people, both men and women, end up in relationships where these things start to happen slowly and it happens covertly to where sometimes the victim doesn't even realize it's happening. You know, it's just there's there's abuse, emotional, whether it's emotional, um, physical, psychological or any other any other form of abuse. The dynamics of it are complicated and it's not always as easy as just being able to walk away. So it's easy to say that you would walk away. Like I never in a million years thought that I would have stayed with someone who was blatantly cheating online for the whole world to see and stealing my ideas after I told them it. I don't want you talking about the same topic that I'm talking about on YouTube this week. Like it blows my mind right? That someone would even behave that way, but he did. And there's, there's other things that this person did that I won't get into, but it was a lot. It was all stuff that piled up. Now there were dynamics involved in that situation that made it really hard for me to leave. And it wasn't just an emotional thing, although I did love that person very much, but there were other dynamics involved. Like my financial situation wasn't doing good. My health had turned for the worse. I had an autoimmune disease that flared up and continued to flare up for months on a daily basis. It was just, it was terrible. And he was the source for most of that misery. But it made leaving complicated. And I don't want that for you. Okay. So if you are single, or if you're dating, and you're not in a relationship yet, and you're thinking about what you want, please be sure <laughs> that you're also thinking about what you don't want and form a plan for that and also visualize how you're going to leave and what you're going to do should those unfortunate things happen. Because again, when you're high value, everyone's gonna want you. Everyone's gonna want you. So you're not gonna attract just good people. We don't attract just good things in our life. We attract both, right? It's the yin and yang, it's the balance, it's duality, everything comes at us. So know what you're going to accept in a relationship and what you won't and mentally rehearse both. It's really important that you complete both these steps. And I do believe that if you do both of these things, that you'll be able to weed out the nonsense faster 
and you will find someone who matches all of the things that you desire. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.